Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favour and honour. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. 
Good morning and welcome to a new online service of Bransfield Evangelical Church. My name is Luca, I'm one of the members of our church and I'm delighted to welcome you here, especially if this is your first Sunday with us. Like every Sunday, we've prepared a service to help us grow in our knowledge of God and of his plan for our world. A service to encourage us, to build us up in our faith, to challenge us and to give us an opportunity to hear updates on what is happening in the life of our church at the moment. We're going to sing together, we're going to read the Bible, we're going to pray and we're going to hear from Ian Naismith, one of our church members, as he preaches to us from the Gospel of John. So let's go ahead and sing our first song and can I encourage you all to join in as we sing together even while we're apart and worship God as a church family. After this song there will be a short talk for the kids and we'll hear from Graham Shanks, our pastor, who has some really exciting news for us on our return to our church building in a few weeks. Let's sing. Sing 
doesn't know my name is Peter I'm the youth pastor at Brunsfield and I want to speak particularly to the kids just now right if these guys just uh, have turn around and have a look okay you might be able to see at home that we've got uh, some funny shapes on the wall uh, and this is a puzzle for you uh, to work out now, it helps if you can read so if you can't read you might need to ask a grown-up see if they can read it for you ask them if they can read this for you can any of you guys read this um, no. Okay, so what we've got here is we've got what we've got. We've got a black square. We've got a, a long black rectangle. Another. Uh, another rectangle with three rectangles sticking out of it. We've got another one with one sticking out the side. A small rectangle, something that maybe looks a bit like a, an axe upside down. And then we've got a cross. Now, what do you think that could mean? Mm. Any ideas? No. no. Any I ideas don't. at home? No. <laughs> this is quite a puzzle, isn't it? Uh, and why are we thinking about a puzzle? Well, who have we been learning about? Joseph. We've been learning about Joseph. And his life is a bit of a puzzle. And he helped some people that had some puzzling things. Okay? Joseph had to work out the puzzle. You see, Joseph, we remember, Joseph was, it, we heard that Joseph was put into prison. But while he was in prison, he met a baker and a cupbearer. Now, they worked for the pharaoh. They worked for the king of Egypt and they had these puzzling dreams. But Joseph was able to ask God what they meant and he told the cupbearer and the baker what the dreams meant. And the cupbearer, he went to work for the pharaoh again. He went to work for the king of Egypt again. And Joseph said, remember me. But you know what? For two whole years, the cupbearer forgot all about Joseph and Joseph was left in prison for no reason for two years. Uh, and this is why I'm not telling you the answer to this puzzle just now, because I want you to wait too. You're not going to have to wait for two years though. So, eventually, after these two years, what happened was the Pharaoh then had a dream. And the Pharaoh couldn't work out what the dream was. It was really puzzling. In Pharaoh's dream, there were seven uh, big, fat, healthy cars, and they were eaten up by the skinny, these seven skinny cars that just stayed skinny. Uh, and there were seven really healthy, fat um, ears of corn, and they were swallowed up by these thin ears of corn that stayed thin. And he was really puzzled, perplexed, had no idea what this dream was, and he asked people, and nobody could tell him. But then the cupbearer, he remembered. Who did he remember? Joseph. He remembered Joseph. So they sent for Joseph, and Joseph came, and Joseph was able to tell Pharaoh, what the answer to this puzzle was. He was able to tell him what the dream meant because God told Joseph. And he told him that what the dream meant was that there was going to be seven really good years, loads of food for seven years. Okay, everything was going to grow really well. And then there was going to be seven really bad years when no food was going to grow. 
but God was letting him know this is what was going to happen so that Egypt could prepare for this and so that Joseph could help. Um, and in fact, Joseph became the prime minister of Egypt and he was able to help. And it was all because God was going to rescue and protect his people. He was going to protect Jacob and all his sons and family. Okay, this is all to do with God's promise to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. He was going to make them into a nation. He was going to use Egypt to protect them. So, what does this puzzle mean? Well, okay, let me give you a clue. Okay, what you need to do is you need to not look at the black shapes. You need to look at the brown shapes in between the black shapes. Okay, see what you can see. Okay, I'm going to help you by drawing a line. Okay, what can you see? Is that helping? Yeah. What, what can you see? Okay, yeah. so we need a line at the top, and we need a line at the bottom, and we can put a line on the end here. We're sort of putting a frame around it to help you read the shapes, the brown shapes in between the black shapes. Okay, what can you see? Okay, we've got a J, we've got a J. A J and an E. We've got an E, an E. And then an S. And then an S, a S. So, J, S. Yeah? What have we got here? An A. Yeah, the letter U. And then what do you think this last letter is going to be? And another S, another S. So what have we got? Jesus. We've got Jesus, okay? And it was there all the time. Jesus was there all the time. It's just you couldn't see it because you were looking at the wrong oh, thing. Yeah. Okay? You shouldn't have been looking at this black shape. You should have been looking at these brown shapes. It's actually letters. J-E-S-U-S, -S, Jesus. And you know, when we learn about Joseph, you can't help but think about Jesus. Because Joseph was treated a bit like Jesus. Mm. Okay? Jesus um, was God's chosen one, and he came to rescue us. Just like Joseph was chosen by God, uh, and God had a plan to rescue his people, Jesus, like Joseph, he was treated badly. Um, but it was all part of God's plan. God had a plan for Joseph's life. God had a plan for Jesus' life. And uh, when Jesus was killed, actually it was part of God's plan. It was his plan to rescue us. So let me pray. Dear God, thank you for the story of Joseph and all that we can learn from Joseph and his life and how he, he trusted in you. And we thank you for how you had a plan for his life and how you used him to rescue his family. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus uh, and the plan that you had so that Jesus uh, could take the punishment for us so that we don't have to. Lord, I thank you for that plan to rescue us. Amen. Well, good morning, Brunswick family. I really hope that you are doing well. Listen, I just thought I'd take a few moments this morning to update you on our plans to restart our services again at the building in Brunsfield in the next weeks and months. Listen, here's the honest truth of it. See, as great as these online broadcasts have been over the last number of months, and they've been great, haven't they? And how much we've all really appreciated them and, and how grateful we are to God that he's always got this incredible habit of raising up the right people with the right gifts at the right time uh, to enable us to put on this broadcast. As great as they've been, we've dearly missed meeting together in person, haven't we? And we've realised, uh, some of us maybe even for the first time, just how wonderful a thing it is when, when we gather together with the express purpose of uh, singing God's praises and, and hearing from him as we turn to the Bible. And, and how we so benefit from that is together we grow as Christians 
Um, we've dearly missed that over the last uh, number of months. And so you can imagine that we were thrilled to hear recently from our government that they have given us the green light to, to think about beginning to meet together in our building again. And, and we just want to give, all God's, give God all the praise uh, and the glory for that. And we also want to recognise that many people in our world are still suffering acutely from this virus. And also many brothers and sisters around the world would, would give anything for an opportunity to meet together in person again. So we don't want to take that for granted and rather we want to seize it with both hands. And so I just want to give you two dates for your diary that we're, we've targeted uh, as a leadership team that we're going to think about beginning to restart the services again at the building. Listen, the government have produced their own guidance on how we can do that safely and we're going to follow that to the best of our abilities because we want to give everybody who comes in our building confidence uh, that they're coming into a building where we've taken every measure that we can possibly take to ensure uh, that the building is as virus uh, free as we can possibly make it. But here's the two dates for your diary then. The first is the evening of Sunday the 9th of August. And this is the Sunday evening that we've targeted for the restart of our evening service. Now for various reasons we, we, we've targeted that as perhaps the easiest and the simplest way to begin to meet together again. And so, so just two things maybe I want to draw to your attention. Um, the first is that we were, we're, we're going to try and take communion together again at that service. You know, we recognise that we've all uh, dearly missed remembering the Lord together in that way. And so we're going to try and take communion together at that service. But we recognise the limited numbers we'll be able to accommodate if we're to do this well and safely. So we've also made that service, we're going to make it available on Zoom for you to watch at home in your own time, recognising that many people won't be able to get out to the building. So that's the evening service. And we're going to hope to have the experience of running four of these evening services and, and, and learn from that um, before we move to begin to go back to two services on a Sunday. And so the date uh, that we've targeted for the resumption of the morning service is the morning of the 6th of September. Now, it's a, a couple of things worth flagging there as well. We're really working hard to, th to ensure that we can have kids church in some way or another, whatever that might look like, uh, available at uh, that Sunday service. And, and I really want you to be praying and, and thinking uh, of the kids' church leaders as they have conversations about how they can do that safely. It's, it's a very complicated thing. Uh, and so we'd greatly value your, your prayers for wisdom as, as we seek that uh, way forward for kids' church. And another thing to flag as well is, is we're hopeful that this broadcast can in time be replaced with a, a live stream uh, from the building of that service uh, for you to watch in your own time. Again, recognising the limited numbers uh, that we're able to accommodate. So those are the two Sundays that we've targeted. Again, we just really value your prayers. You might be asking as well about the breaking of bread service. Well, listen, we've taken the really hard decision, having weighed up the government advice and also looked at the, the current format of that service as it, as it currently is, uh, that it's not a wise thing to do to restart that service in its current format. Listen, we recognise that that will come as a hard bit of news to many of our members. And so we would ask for your patience and your understanding and again, your prayers as we seek to find a way in time uh, to restart that service. Well, Brian, so those are just a couple of dates for your diary. I really want you to be thinking about uh, those dates and prayerfully uh, thinking about the leadership team as, as we go on from here. We just want to do this well to the glory of God in our communities. We continue to, to, to seek to share the good news of Jesus with them. So thank you so much for tuning in. Brunswood, I really do hope you are well and I, I really look forward to seeing you again in person. God bless. How exciting to know that we will be able to meet in person soon in our church building. Let me just mention a few things that are happening this week. But first of all, congratulations to the Irving family on the safe arrival of baby Matthew. Let's keep Matthew, Hazel, the rest of the family whom we've just seen in the kids talk in our prayers as everyone settles in. The evening service for this Sunday has been uploaded on YouTube already, so please go ahead and watch it tonight or whenever you get the chance. This sermon concludes the series in the Book of Esther with chapters 9 and 10. We're also meeting tonight for our prayer meeting. 
We usually meet from 8 to 8.30. We've been meeting since the start of lockdown to pray together. And these prayer meetings have been such an encouraging time during, during this difficult time. And so I would encourage as many of you as possible to join tonight, even if you've never joined one before. We'll be meeting a bit earlier than usual, at a quarter to eight, just so we get a chance to um, discuss what we've learned from today's message. There will be two questions coming up on the screen after Ian's service, and we will use those two questions as a starting point for our conversation tonight. This is also a small group week, which means your group will be meeting at some point. If you're not sure when, then please get in touch with your small group leader and ask them. And if you're not part of a small group, please just send us an email and we would love to add you to one of the existing groups. You might know that we try, maybe every month or so, to set some time aside during our services to have an update from one of our church ministries. And today we're going to hear from Ruth Aird as the leader of the pastoral care team. The pastoral care team have been working really hard during this time of lockdown, as you can imagine. And because one of the themes of today's message is going to be serving and being served, we thought it would just really be very appropriate for us to hear from the pastoral care team today. So over to Ruth just now. Hello everyone. My name is Ruth Ed and I'm one of the members of Brunsfield Evangelical Church. My role is to coordinate the pastoral care team which presently consists of 11 people. Our aim is to befriend all the people who come to our church for whatever reason, seeking to show them the love of the Lord Jesus Christ that we have experienced in our lives. This relationship becomes a two-way process as we discover mutual benefits in getting together with all ages. During lockdown, these relationships have become particularly precious as we have met together in coffee chat calls, on FaceTime or Zoom, deepening and enriching our lives as we have listened to one another, supporting and encouraging through some challenging times. The pastoral care team functions by working in pairs with each age group in the church so that no one is missed out. Students, 20s to 30s, families, 40s to 60s and the over 70s are all able to call on someone from the pastoral care team for help in whatever circumstances they find themselves. During this present crisis, the team has met every two to three weeks to support each other and also to organise visits or phone calls where appropriate and to pray for the whole church family. When the very first Christian church was being set up in Jerusalem, the disciples followed the lead of the Lord Jesus, who said that the most important thing was to love the Lord first and then to love each other. The disciples set up teams to care for many people who passed through their doors, listening to them and encouraging them in the day-to-day -day cares of their lives. We too, aim to be like those first disciples, caring for one another and receiving care as if it came from Jesus himself. In fact, as a team we have discovered the joy of serving all who come to our church. Church is like family, embracing each other as we live and serve together in different capacities across church, spilling out into the community around us. As ordinary people, we know that we are broken human beings trying to make meaning in this life of what goes on around us. The only meaning that makes sense and is the truth comes from God himself who sent his son to die for us in order that he might put our sinful lives back together again. When Jesus meets broken people and gives them new life, they are transformed and so pass on new life to others. If you want to get in touch with a member of the pastoral care team at Brunsfield Evangelical Church for any reason, then please use the email address at the bottom of the screen. 
we would love to share with you the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, who gives it freely to all who ask. Thank you, Ruth. Let's now spend a couple of minutes in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Father, as we said at the start of the service, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. How true this is for all of us, Father, as we recognise that you are the only one that we find strength, that we find shelter, that we find rest in. But most importantly, Father, we recognise that what we find in you is life, eternal life, through the death on that cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you because through that sacrifice, sinful as we are, you find us acceptable. And you welcome us, Father, because of your never-ending love for us. And Father, we realise and we confess that so often we just do not behave as if we truly believe that one day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. As we give into temptation and find ourselves spending our time, our energy, our resources in things that do not bring you glory. Father, we ask you to help us grow in our wisdom, help us grow in our faith, in a way that will make us more obedient to you, Father, in a way that will bring you glory and will make us become more and more similar to Jesus. Father, we thank you for how we've been blessed with these amazing opportunities to have these services and prayer meetings online, even during this time of, of lockdown. And we're so grateful for this. But we also, Father, recognise that so many people in our country and in the rest of the world are suffering because of this virus outbreak. Whether that's because they're mourning loved ones, they're struggling with their own health and um, maybe finances. Father, we just pray for an end to all of this as soon as possible. Father, we know, we believe that you are powerful and that you can move things so that a solution is, is found as soon as possible, Father. Father, we thank you for the, the babies, the newborn babies who've just um, been added to our congregation. Thank you for Matthew, thank you for Sana. Thank you for Joel, and we pray for them and their families, particularly as they um, struggle with a few health issues, Father. We pray for protection, and we pray that everything will be resolved soon, and we pray for resilience for, for the new parents. And we also pray, Father, for um, patience and for strength for the expecting couples that we have in our church. Help us, Father, as a congregation, also be of support to the parents and to the babies and help us go be good examples of, of Christian life, Father. And we pray from this young age already for these children, for their spiritual life, Father, may they grow in, to become children of yours, Father, to recognise you as their saviour. Lord, we thank you for the pastoral care team for the hard work that everyone has been putting in and keeps putting in, often behind the scenes. Again, we pray for wisdom for them and also for strength. And we pray, Father, for us as a church, and um, generally that we can really be a, a church where fellowship is practised and where godly friendships are developed, Father, as we spur one another in in our faith. Father, thank you for this service. We ask you to bless the rest of this service and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're now going to sing another song and then Derek and Lynn will read today's passages to us before Ian preaches. <laughs> Oh, precious is the 
overflow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Hi, my name is Lynn and I've been a member at Brunsfield for two years now. Um, I'm going to read Psalm 51 verses 1 to 10. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Hi, my name is Derek and I'm Lynn's husband and I'm reading from the New Testament today um, in John chapter 13 verses 1 through 20. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he'd come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. 
After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, dragging them to the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realise now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not every one of them was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is who, what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is his messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that, you've, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. I am not referring to all of you. I know, that, I know those that I have chosen, but this is to fulfil this passage of scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. Amen. Now let's pray for Ian before the sermon begins. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word, and as we think on these things, open our hearts and our minds to hear you. We pray for Ian, and we give thanks for the gifts that you've given him. Pray for him as he guides us through his messages and open our hearts to this. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ian, and I'm delighted to repeat the welcome that Luca gave you earlier. We're continuing today our series of Encounters with Jesus from John's Gospel, and we're looking at the passage that Derek just read to us under the title, A Puzzled Disciple, that disciple, of course, being Peter. When I was growing up at Brunsfield, one of my friends, John, was a talented artist. And one day, John's father came to him and said, I've got a special job I want you to do. I want you to make a sign that says, Divine Service Performed Here Three Times Daily. John was a bit puzzled about what his father meant, but he usually went away, uh, uh, and in his best script uh, and with his best design, he produced a sign and brought it back. Divine service performed here three times daily. And his father said to him, right, that's great, well done. I want you to go and hang that over the sink in the kitchen, because that's where you have the opportunity in this house to perform divine service three times daily. Well, it was a good lesson, and it was one that came to my mind as I was reading this passage this, for this morning. Not just because it features a basin and a towel, foot washing and dishwashing need both of these. But the lesson is really the same as the Lord is trying to get out to us today. We serve God by serving others, and we often need to do that in ways that might seem to dent our pride, might even sometimes seem mundane or even demeaning. And so we're going to look today at serving others and also at being served by others. But there's a second significance of this bowl and towel. In Matthew chapter 23, the Lord Jesus has a diatribe against the religious leaders of his day. Seven woes exposing their hypocrisy. And the Lord Jesus says as one of them, Matthew 23, verse 25, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup of dish, and then the outside also, will be clean. Clean on the outside, but dirty on the inside. And that too is a lesson that Jesus is trying to present to us in this passage. He has a discussion with Peter about bathing and about washing feet, but actually it emerges that really it's about being clean 
or being dirty inside. So we'll be looking at clean feet and clean hearts. But first, let's have a look at the background to this passage. We're on the eve of Calvary. Within 24 hours, the Lord Jesus will have died on the cross for our sins. And throughout this passage in John's Gospel, there are references to that. For example, in verse 1 of chapter 13, it, it talks about the Lord Jesus loving his disciples to the end. The word could be translated to the finish, and that parallels the Lord Jesus' final cry from the cross. It is finished. John talks about him laying aside his garment and taking it up again. And the Lord Jesus uses the same words earlier in the gospel about laying down his life and taking it up again. And there are several similar references as we go through. Very much in the Lord's mind and in John's mind as he writes is the fact that the cross is very close. But the disciples don't know that. They haven't realised that the Lord is going to die within a very short time. As far as they're concerned, they have come with him to an upper room to celebrate the Passover together. And of course, as part of that, the Lord instituted what we call the Lord's Supper or Communion. Now, I see the disciples didn't realise what was happening, but I think there was a real tension in the room. The disciples knew that there was danger about, that the Lord was in danger from the religious leaders because he had exposed their hypocrisy and because he had stood up to them. And so they were very tense. And one of the things that happened during the time in the upper room was that the disciples had an argument about which of them was the greatest. That was one of the things on their minds. And I think that's relevant as we look at this incident here. Because the Lord Jesus was trying to teach them a lesson about greatness and about serving others. If you went to a house for a meal, the custom was that the host would arrange for someone to wash your feet. Your feet got quite dusty walking around Israel, and the host would arrange for your feet to be washed. And that was something that was done by the lowest servant in the house. The more senior servants would think it was below them. And certainly anyone who wasn't a servant wouldn't think this was something they should be doing. And so the Lord Jesus come to this room and there are no servants. There are only the 12 disciples plus Jesus. And perhaps the disciples were thinking, well, who's going to wash Jesus' feet? And maybe all of them were thinking, well, it's not going to be me, because if I wash Jesus' feet, I'll have to wash the feet of the other disciples as well. And I'm not going to wash the feet of Matthew or of Thomas or of Philip, because I think I'm greater than them. They should be doing it, not me. And so you can imagine their horror when the Lord Jesus himself takes off his garment, takes the bowl of water and the towel and goes round and washes the disciples' feet. Now it looks as like if the first few of them accepted it, but when he got to Peter, Peter objected very strongly. And we'll look in a few minutes at that discussion between the Lord Jesus and Peter. But we're going to skip over it for the moment and we're going to think about the key lesson that the Lord takes from his washing the disciples' feet. The lesson about serving and being served. So the disciples hadn't been willing to do something that the Lord was willing to do for them. The one who was the master became the servant. And Jesus says, I'm leaving you an example that you should wash one another's feet. Now, I think as we look at this passage, we shouldn't take it that we literally need to wash one another's feet. That's not something that in our culture is normally done. We may do it um, to demonstrate our humility. I have nothing against that. People want to do it. But it's not something we do particularly to serve others. Perhaps my dishwashing example is a little bit better um, from that point of view uh, as something that we might do to serve others, although I don't think it gets quite to the heart of just how demeaning washing someone's feet would have been seen to be. But the Lord is giving us an example and he's saying, you should follow my example and you should be willing 
to serve others. If I was willing to serve you, then you need to serve others. And often you will serve them in unspectacular ways. I think all of us probably would like to be seen to be serving in public ways and to get recognition for it. But the Lord says we also should be serving, perhaps even more importantly, should be serving when it's not seen, when it's difficult for us, perhaps even when it dents our pride a bit, because we have a love for the Lord Jesus, and that's reflected in our love for others. Jesus said um, in Luke's Gospel, the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to be served, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Did not come to serve, but to be served. And he juxtaposed that directly with his giving of his life. Not that it is on the same scale in terms of the sacrifice he made, but serving and being served is really important to the Lord Jesus. In 1 John chapter 3, John writes this, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Do you get the two verses that are connected so closely again here? The one verse talking about the heroic. We lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. The other verse talking about the mundane, the everyday, seeing someone who's in need and meeting that need. And it's really important if we're believers in the Lord Jesus, that we are willing to serve others and we're willing to serve them in ways that we might not find very attractive and that might also not be very publicly recognized. One other thing before we move on. I talked about serving and being served. And that comes out earlier in the passage in the Lord's conversation with Peter. Peter was offended that the Lord should think he would wash Peter's feet. And yet Jesus says, unless I wash your feet, you have no part in me. Perhaps I could talk to a particular group this morning of those whose natural inclination in the church, perhaps in the home as well, is to serve. Who don't need the exhortation to, to serve others because they do it, and they do it with real love and real care. And yet for you, for any of us in that position, it is very important that we are also willing to be served to be served by Jesus, and to be served by others representing him. Remember the story in Luke chapter 10. Jesus goes to the house of Martha and Mary, and Martha's really busy preparing the meal. Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet, and Martha gets more and more upset at what's happening. And eventually she, she says to Jesus, why don't you do something about this? Tell her to help me. And Jesus says, Martha, you're worried about many things. But one thing is important and that is what Mary is doing. She is sitting at my feet learning from me. And however busy we are, however much we may serve the Lord and we may serve others, it's really important that we spend time with Jesus, letting him minister to us and also that we let others perform their service and to serve us at times as well serving and being served. Second thing I want to think about is clean feet and clean hearts. And that is uh, the discussion that the Lord Jesus has earlier on with Peter. This discussion that seems to be about washing feet and having a bath, but actually very clearly is about being clean or dirty inside. Now is the relevance of the passage from Psalm 51 that Lynn read for us earlier, where David has committed a sin and he feels really dirty. He feels that he is soiled inside and that he needs to be cleaned. 
Look at the language. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Now David had just committed adultery. He, he'd, the Bathsheba had become pregnant and to uh, hide the fact that David was the father, he'd arranged to have her husband killed in battle. So he was quite justified in feeling really dirty inside. And there are some sins, I think, that make us feel dirty inside as well. Sexual sin, whether with our body, our eyes, or our mind, may well make us feel dirty. Addictions could make us feel dirty, including addictive habits, perhaps perpetual dishonesty, telling little lies repeatedly. These kind of things we recognise are wrong and they make us feel dirty inside. But really, all sin makes us dirty. Did you notice when we had the passage um, from Matthew 23 uh, about Jesus talking about the Pharisees uh, 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 and the dirt that was in them? What was it that made them dirty? It was greed and self-indulgence. Ouch. And then Paul in his letters, in several of his letters, he has a list of things that characterise those who are living by the flesh. A list of sins. And among them, there are many of the kind that we might expect to see there. There are the, the sexual sins that society looks at, perhaps not so much these days, but looks at uh, askance uh, and recognises that they are wrong. But then there are things like greed and envy and loose talk. Out. Because these are things also that all of us might be aware of in our lives, but don't take too seriously. Paul says these make us dirty as well. All sin makes us dirty before God and makes us subject to God's punishment. That's the bad news. The good news is that all of our sins can be forgiven through the death of the Lord Jesus. There is none of us that is too bad to be forgiven. There is no sin that God is not willing to forgive because of Jesus' sacrifice or on the cross if we confess it to him. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, The blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. Now, in this passage, uh, clearly there are two types of washing that Jesus talks about. There is feet washing and there is whole body washing. So Jesus says to Peter, you must let me wash your feet if you want to be part of me, if you want to be my disciple. And Peter says, well, then wash my whole body, please, uh, Lord. Uh, and Jesus says, no, if someone's had a bath, they only need their feet washed. Now, in this, the Lord Jesus, in talking about someone having had a bath, is talking about us coming to him for salvation to begin with. Recognising our sin, recognising the dirt within us, and recognising that only by his blood can we be purified from our sins. It symbolised, isn't it, in baptism. Baptism, uh, one of the pictures it presents to us is dirt being washed from the body, symbolising uh, dirt being washed from the inside as we trust in the Lord Jesus. So there's that once for all uh, time when we come and confess our sins and trust in the Lord Jesus and have our sins forgiven. But our feet constantly get dirty. Or perhaps uh, in the time of coronavirus, we could say our hands get dirty. We need to keep washing our hands regularly to make sure they don't become contaminated. And Jesus says we need that kind of regular washing as well. Yes, we're clean inside through his death for us, but we do get contaminated by society around about us and by our own sinful nature that is still in us. So we need to constantly be coming and confessing our sins to Jesus and being renewed in our fellowship with him, being made again completely clean. A couple of verses on from the one I quoted a minute ago, John chapter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. John writes, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins 
and purify us from all unrighteousness. So I challenge us this morning, have we had that initial cleansing through the blood of the Lord Jesus, coming to him in repentance and faith, being forgiven for our sins? And if so, do we have that experience regularly of coming to him, confessing our sins, feeling again the purity that comes through his blood and being restored to fellowship with him? One last point. Three times in this passage, Judas is referred to. Very much in John's mind and in Jesus' mind is the fact that there are 12 disciples there and one of them doesn't really belong. The other disciples were unaware of it at the time. As far as they were concerned, Judas was one of them. But in reality, Satan had entered into Judas. Judas was not clean like the other disciples. And I think that's a very sobering thought for us. And we should be examining ourselves and saying, am I one of Jesus' disciples? Quite often when we preach, we say, if you're a Christian, then here's a lesson for you. If you're not a Christian, then here's something you should think about. And perhaps some of us, when it comes to the bit that says, if you're not a Christian, we kind of mentally turn off and think that doesn't apply to me. But all of us need to examine ourselves and say, am I really one of the Lord's disciples? Have I really got his salvation? 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, Paul writes, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith test yourselves. Now Paul is thinking that most of the Corinthians, when they apply that test to themselves, will decide that yes, indeed, they are in the faith, they are Christians, and will then conclude from that that Paul's ministry is valid as he says it is. But he does envisage the possibility that there will be some who are not truly Christians, that they're not in the faith, that they haven't got salvation through the Lord Jesus. And I would suggest to everyone this morning that we examine ourselves, that see, we see whether we are truly the Lord's. Is our faith completely in him for our salvation, for the forgiveness of our sins? And if we can see it is, where is the evidence in a transformed life, in the behaviours, in the love that we show to others? Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. A basin and a towel. Serving and being served. Clean feet and clean hearts. If we belong to the Lord Jesus, let's follow his example. Let's go and during this week, let us serve others in any way that we can. And let all of us make sure that we are clean inside, clean through faith in the Lord Jesus, and have clean feet figuratively as well, that we confess our sins to him regularly and know again that experience of his forgiveness and of fellowship with him. Let's pray together, and for our prayer, I want to take the words of an old chorus, and let's apply them to ourselves. Let's pray. Cleanse me from my sin, Lord. Put your power within, Lord. Take me as I am, Lord, and make me all your own. Keep me day by day, Lord, underneath your sway, Lord. Make my heart your palace and your royal throne. Amen. What can we do in our culture that follows Jesus' example in washing his disciples' feet?
how should we examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith? Christ in me, yet 
This is the end of our service. Thank you so much for joining us. If there's anything at all that you would like to discuss, if you have any questions about anything that's been said during the service today, then please do reach out. There's an email address in the description of the video below that you can write to. We would love to hear from you. Let me conclude by reading a couple of verses from Psalm 84, the same Psalm that was read to us in the introduction. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house, they are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Amen. my